This video, we'll be taking a look about the instruction pipelines of modern CPUs, but before we begin, let's talk about what a CPU pipeline is. A CPU pipeline is just the steps that the instructions must go through to be completed. A pipeline is made up of multiple stages, each stage with its own fixed function hardware capable of doing certain dedicated tasks. When all these pieces of hardware are put together, you have a system that is both very flexible and able to achieve high throughputs. So there are some good reasons to use a pipeline. One of the most important, and yet often overlooked, is that you don't need to duplicate any hardware. If you have a piece of hardware dedicated to memory access, then whatever else goes into that system doesn't need to have any of its own memory access hardware. The next major, and often touted reason for pipelining, is to increase the system throughput. If you have four pipeline stages, then you can have the system working on four tasks at any one time, thus being one of the most important reasons to pipeline. Also note that people naturally pipeline work without really thinking about it. For example, a common real-world pipeline analogy is how a pipeline works in a clothes washing pipeline. Imagine you have a basket of clothes to be washed, a washing machine, a dryer, and then a second basket for these new dry, clean clothes. Here, you could say that we have a six stage pipeline. These are getting the clothes that need washing out of the basket, sorting the clothes by colours, washing the clothes in the washing machine, drying the clothes in the dryer, unloading the clothes from the dryer into the basket, and taking the clean basket upstairs or wherever to put the clean clothes away. So the first stage is getting the clothes out of the basket to be washed. This is similar to the fetch stage in the CPU pipeline. The second stage you're going to use is sorting your clothes by colour as not to mix whites with coloureds and lights from darks. This is similar to the decoding stage in a CPU pipeline. The third stage is actually washing the clothes in the washing machine. This is one of the actual execution stages. The fourth stage is drying the clothes in the dryer. This is also like a CPU execution stage. The fifth stage is unloading the dry clothes from the dryer. This is similar to the register write back slash retirement stage in a CPU pipeline. The sixth and last stage in our analogy is taking the dry clothes to be put away. Whilst this isn't like an exact pipeline stage in any modern processor, this is similar to writing data out to the memory hierarchy. Now instead of washing our clothes, we are doing an FMA instruction in our CPU. The stages that this instruction may go through would be fetching from the L1 instruction cache, decode, multiply, add, register write back, and then data write back into the L1 data cache. Those are all of the six stages I've just mentioned. A good thing about this is that if we have six stages where clothes could be, we could be doing six of them together, each pile of clothes at a different stage. For example, when the first pile of clothes is in the dryer, the second could be in the washing machine, and the third could be being sorted from the basket. Potentially, if there are enough people working, someone could be putting the dry clothes into the dry basket and taking the clothes to be put away. This is what allows pipelines to have such a high throughput, because multiple pieces of work can be operated on at one go. Also, the number of pieces of work that can be operated on at one go is the number of pipeline stages the system has. This isn't exactly a good thing, however, as if there is a piece of work in the pipeline that requires a previous piece of work to complete, then the whole queue of work must stop going into the pipeline until a dependent work item has finished. This puts what we call a bubble into the pipeline. In the pipeline, there is also the problem that if you are washing a basket of clothes, and it turns out you made a mistake and aren't meant to be washing that basket of clothes, then with a longer pipeline, you have now wasted the most amount of time with getting more clothes partway through the washing process. It also means that when you now get onto the correct basket, you have got a longer amount of stages to wait until your clothes start coming out of the other end. Not only that, but in CPUs, the longer the pipeline is, the farther forwards you have to look in time, i.e. the better your future predictions must be as you are now operating on more instructions in one go. Now we have been through generic pipelines, let's look at the kind of pipeline stages that you can expect to find in a modern CPU. Do note that these won't be all of the individual stages found in a modern CPU, like Skylake or Zen, as these modern CPUs require the stages that I will be discussing to be broken down into multiple sub-stages. For example, there can be multiple fetch and decode stages. Now with the introduction out of the way, 
we can start looking at the major stages found in a modern high performance processor. The first stage in any CPU pipeline will be the fetch stage. What this stage does is it fetches code that will be executed by the processor into the core. This code may be coming from the main memory, L1, L2 or L3 cache, or even a micro op cache. This stage is fairly simple in theory, and it's usually thought of as the input to the CPU cores. Therefore, the hardware for this stage will usually be located next to the L1 instruction cache, maybe alongside the decoded micro op queue, depending on the architecture's topology. Lastly, if the fetch stage is fetching from a decoded micro op queue, then anything fetched from here may skip the decode stage, as it has already been decoded and been queued into the order of the expected usage. This was introduced with Intel's Pentium 4 in 2000, known as the Trace Cache, and it was first introduced by AMD in the Zen architecture in 2017. Also note that using this cache increases power efficiency, as energy doesn't have to be spent decoding instructions, and it reduces instruction latency, as these instructions are able to bypass a stage. Once the code has been fetched, we run into the next problem the processor has, and that is, it actually can't, so to say, speak the language. These processors are executing compiled x86 code. Each x86 instruction is called a macro op. The thing is, however, x86 is a highly complex instruction set, and so must be broken down into smaller, simpler instructions that the pipeline stages are capable of understanding and operating on. These are called micro ops. So x86 instructions go into the front side of the decode stage, and micro ops leave the back side of the decode stage. It's also at this point where micro code takes the root of its effect. This is micro code, not micro ops. They are different. So what is micro code? You may have heard about micro code updates that helped Intel to patch out Spectre and Meltdown exploits. Micro code is essentially a table inside the processor's decode stage that you can look up an x86 instruction in, and it will tell the rest of the hardware how to execute this instruction in the form of micro ops. I might do a video about those vulnerabilities and how Intel patched those exploits out, however, because this shares good insight. Also note that if a branch instruction is found and decoded, that is an instruction that will essentially change the order that the code is executing. The target location of the branch, that is where the code will next start executing from, will be put on what's called the branch target buffer, so that the CPU can now start fetching code from that location. This will however cause bubbles in the pipeline, as now all of those instructions we have fetched after the branch instruction are now sections of incorrect code. The next stage that is commonly found inside of modern high performance processors is the micro op fusion stage. This stage has no major effect on the execution path of instructions, however it has effects on the CPU's power efficiency. This stage was first used in Intel's core architecture in order to improve the power efficiency of the microops transit through the pipeline, as Intel had found that moving the volume of microops through the pipeline of the Pentium 4 had contributed to high power usage. So by fusing individual microops together into one really wide instruction, a type of VLIW instruction, this allows for the larger fused instructions to move through the pipeline slower whilst maintaining the same microop throughput. This allows power to be saved by moving larger instructions slower than individual ones at very high speed. The next common stage to cover is the stack pointer renaming. So this stage typically comes after the typical front end stages such as fetch decoding and micro op cache and queue operations. This pipeline stage is difficult to explain mainly due to the fact that to fully understand you kind of have to know a bit about some of the lower levels of programming. But here I go. So code executes in what's called a stack frame. What a stack frame is, is like a little program inside of the main program. So if you're aware of the concepts of functions, methods or subroutines in programming, these are all executed in their own stack frame. It's like a little program inside of a main program that we will be entering during the process of the main program's execution. Run some code and then we'll return from the subprogram back to the main program. The reason why we need to cover this is because the main program and subprogram or stack frame may be stored in other areas of memory. So when we go from the main program to the subprogram, we need to remember where the main program is in memory so we can return back to it from when we've finished the subprogram. The reason of this pipeline stage is to recognize a stack frame change microop and stores the return memory address inside a table in hardware. 
This stored address will be where we return to when we finish the sub-program. This increases performance, because otherwise we may have to execute other micro-ops to physically do a memory access to write these memory addresses into, say, the L1 data cache. The register renaming stage is where things can get kind of complicated. When programs want to operate on a value, such as a game, you may play a character with health. If you take damage, code needs to be run to remove health from your character, and your health is stored in a storage element in the CPU core called a register. The problem is that code actually states what register we are to run on. So what happens if we run out of registers? Or if two different programs want to use the same register? Could they ever write each other? Well, thankfully not, because we have a stage called register renaming. And what this does is it virtualizes the registers. So if we have two programs that both want to write to register A, they will both be writing to different physical register, but they will both believe they're writing to register A, as that physical register has been renamed to them. This is similar to the memory virtualization concept, however, it's just been scaled down for registers. Right, the next pipeline stage is the big one. This is the one where the washing machine and the dryer is. This is the execution stage, and this is where the code comes to be executed and have its job done. Now, how AMD and Intel handle these stages are a little bit different. Intel's way is to have a scheduler with reservation stages, which is basically a feeder into the execution hardware. All the execution hardware is mixed together, and there are no separate instruction feeders for integer and floating point instructions. How AMD handles these pipeline stages is with separate sub-pipelines, with separate feeders and schedulers for the integer and floating execution units. This means that AMD has kept the integers and the floats separate where Intel has mixed them together. For example, the first reservation station in the Skylake pipeline handles both integers and floats. So it's here that the majority of the program code is going to be executed. If you are doing calculations, for example, your character took damage so you have to subtract some health from your character, it's in this hardware that the subtraction is going to take place and as I said in my last video, should your health be an integer, this will take one clock cycle to finish in this stage. However, if your health was a float, it could take three cycles on Zen and four in Skylake. Now, just because we have done all the calculations, we aren't finished yet as the result hasn't gotten back to the main program yet. All we have done is worked out what your health will be. The last pipeline stage that I'm going to cover is the retirement stage. This stage is where all of the temporary registers used by the micro-ops are coupled into the permanent registers. So for example, in the game where your health is stored in register A, this is where the register A will be updated with a new value. This pipeline stage may also be known as the register write-back stage. However, retirement in modern CPUs is a lot more complicated than just register write-back. For instance, temporary registers could have been used to allow some instructions to say, skip the line. Essentially, it could have been executed out of order. This is allowed if the instructions had no major dependencies on the results of the instructions in front of it, and also if the instructions in front of it couldn't execute as maybe they were waiting on some resources to come available. There is even allowed to be some weak dependencies in prior instructions if the CPU is good enough. If there are, then there is another part of this stage that will write the results to a buffer called the reorder buffer, and when the two codependent instructions are complete, it will work them together such that the program never knew that one instruction had ever jumped the line. Another thing that can happen is the values in the registers can be written to the L1 data cache. In the clothes washing example, this is the basket where the clean clothes go before being put away. So to wrap this up, why do we use them? Well, they allow us to increase CPU throughput by allowing multiple bits of work to be done at once. Also, they can allow CPU processors to run faster by having more smaller stages. Each stage has to do less work so it can clock higher. But of course, a major downside to more stages is we have to be able to better predict future execution paths and if we make a mistake, we have bigger bubbles in the pipeline. This is one of the downfalls of the Pentium 4. Those are all the major stages that make up a modern processor's pipeline. I hope you've learned something and enjoyed the video.